Pranams and a warm welcome to all of you. My name is Sister Draupadi, and it is a joy today to be able to share with you some of the wisdom teachings of our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, who has so lovingly and freely shared them with us. But first, let us begin by praying together, having a period of chanting and meditation. Let us close our eyes and lift our gaze to the point between the eyebrows, the seat of concentration, the Christ center, the Kutasta center. And as we invoke the presence of God and the great Gurus, let us visualize the light of God and feel that we are baptized and bathed in His divine light. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lari Mashai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, Divine Gurudev, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. O oh, Father, with folded hands we come to offer to thee our whole being. We saturate our prayers with deep love. Give us toward thee the simple, sincere devotion of a child. Divine Mother, teach our hearts to pray. Teach our souls to feel that all doors may open and thy presence be revealed. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Amen. Now let us check our meditation posture. The spine should be erect, shoulders back, feet flat on the floor, palms upturned and resting at the juncture between the thigh and abdomen, chest out, your body should feel stable and yet very, very relaxed. And as we engage in chanting to the Divine Beloved of our hearts, let us feel that we're drawing Him near with our love, with our devotion. And after we've chanted, take one thought from the chant and repeat it again and again, going deeper and deeper. Let us now chant and meditate together. Open wide I keep for thee, door of my 
Om. Amen. So in our satsang today, we will discuss frequently asked questions that revolve around two very important questions. What can I do to nurture a personal relationship with God? And what will help me sustain that relationship through all the ups and downs of daily life? And I think that these questions are very key to explore because not only can we think about the beautiful relationship we can have with God, but the sense of security that comes from our relationship with Him not only anchors us in His consciousness, in His presence, but also imparts to us spiritual strength, protection, and the divine understanding with which we can navigate successfully through all the difficulties and the uncertainties that we face in our world today. So if we can understand and apply the precepts taught by Paramahansa Ji, we can not only realize our inherent oneness with our Creator, but we will have achieved the ultimate purpose of life. And our revered and late President Sri Sri Dayamataji understood this point so well, and she reminded us as often as she could about it. I remember on one occasion, I was just a very young nun in the ashram, and it was about a week or two before our annual World Convocation, uh, when most of us were quite engaged in plans and preparations for that event. And so Ma spoke very lovingly and very encouragingly to us about our active life of service. But then Ma turned our attention to our inner spiritual life. And she said something that I've never forgotten because it put everything in its right spiritual perspective. She said, always remember this, the real reason that we are all here is because you and I have embarked on an inner soul journey back to God. And that, my dears, Ma said, is what our life is all about. And what Dayamataji said to those monks and nuns that day didn't apply just to that handful of devotees. But as children of God, it applies to every one of us, monastics and householders alike. And for those of us who have embarked on the spiritual path, this is our highest purpose. This is our lifelong quest. So that, with that said, let's look at our first question. Sometimes I find it difficult to sort out the fundamentals on how to keep ourselves in God's presence. And I would love to know the basic spiritual practices that will help me toward this. Is it possible to encapsulate those fundamentals? If yes, could you please describe them? Well, the answer is yes, it is possible to encapsulate those fundamentals. And what a beautiful way to express our spiritual responsibility to keep ourselves in God's presence. So these are the ways that Paramahansaji and our great gurus have taught. The first is the cultivation of a deep prayer life. The second is the daily practice of scientific meditation as taught by our guru Paramahansaji. And the third is the cultivation of these three qualities in our relationship with God. Love for Him, faith in Him, and surrender to Him. These are the essential practices that will ensure that we have a solid spiritual foundation. So let's look at the cultivation of a deep prayer life. While it is true that some people are more inclined to prayer than to meditation, others are more inclined to meditation and prayer, well, perhaps not so much. But both prayer and meditation go hand in hand. If we pray minimally, if we pray mechanically, or if we leave prayer out altogether, our spiritual practices will be 
imbalanced because to cultivate an intimate relationship with God, we need to talk to Him. We need to connect with Him. He watches our hearts, and if He finds that He's truly welcome there, He responds. And this is an important point to grasp, as one devotee learned. And I want to share with you an excerpt of a letter she wrote, and I'm reading this with her consent. Dear Sister, I'm a little embarrassed to confess this, but I'd been meditating for many years when I realized one day that I still did not have a personal relationship with God. This was so disturbing to me that I almost gave up my practice, thinking that meditation didn't really work. Then I had a revelation, and I know it came from God. Without realizing it, I had become self-satisfied about practicing the techniques and proud that I was so regular in my practice. Once I began to talk to God and I tried to pray for longer and longer periods, my relationship with Him blossomed. What a lesson. And this is why Paramahansaji tells us that Practice of technique is not enough. God is the goal, and yes, techniques are a powerful means toward reaching that goal. But let us not mistake the means for the goal. And Paramahansaji explains why. He said, There is a personal element in our search for God that is more important than mastery over the whole science of yoga. Talking intimately with God, with love and devotion, is that personal element. Why is that? Because that devotional intimacy creates a magnetic pull that God cannot resist. And it also conveys to God that we need Him. We cannot do this without Him. And when we least expect it, He will respond to that magnetic power of our love, and He may reveal Himself to us in different ways, perhaps as an intuitive perception of His presence. We may feel Him bathing our consciousness in His peace, in His joy, in His light. Or we may feel His transforming touch upon us as a beneficial change that takes place within us. And above all, we may feel Him as love, wherein we experience a sweet, deep communion of divine love between the Lord and our soul. Now, to strengthen that personal magnet, Guruji uses one word. And I was actually surprised at how often he uses the word intensity. Intensity of effort when we pray, intensity of effort when we meditate. He says, you must pray intensely. During every little period of leisure, plunge your mind into the infinite thought of him. Talk to him intimately. When you yearn for God with intensity, He will come to you. And Gurudev would also say that we should shake the heavens with our cries, with our divine demands. And what did Jesus say? Pray unceasingly. Of course, that does not mean straining. It means to bring a calm, concentrated focus to our prayers, coupled with an unwavering faith that conveys to God that His response is forthcoming. Paramahansaji shared a story that illustrates the principle of intensity of prayer, of unceasing prayer. There was a disciple whom Guruji loved who was going through a difficult time in his life and was going astray. And the Master tried in every way possible 
to dissuade him, but because the devotee had made up his mind to go in the wrong direction, the guru wasn't able to help him at that time. But then Guruji's great love and concern for this disciple came to the fore, and he began to pray for him. And the guru said he sat under a banyan tree and resolved to pray all day long until he received a response from God. And while he prayed, he also visualized that disciple. And these are his words. Fervently and repeatedly, I broadcast to him a mental message. God has told me to command you to return. Again and again, Guruji prayed and sent this mental message to the young man. Guruji said, By evening, my body and mind were athrill with the intuition that he was coming. At last, there he was at the gate. The prodigal son had come back to the fold. The disciple pranamed and said to the master, All day long, wherever I went and whatever I did, I beheld your image. What was it all about? Guruji replied, God was calling you through me. It was his call, not mine. There was no selfish motive in my desire, but I had made up my mind. I wouldn't stir from this place until you came. So beautiful. This is the power of love that a guru has for his disciple and also the power of intense, unceasing prayer. And this is why Sri Dayamataji has told us that if we prayed like this for just 15 minutes every day, it would change our life. So now our, our next question. So having said that, devotees do share with us that they face obstacles when they try to pray. For example, they've said, how do I pray to a God that I don't know? Is God really going to hear me? He seems so remote, so far away, as if he hears our prayers but doesn't respond to them. Another one said, I am dealing with shame about my past. I feel so unworthy to talk to the monastics much less God. Well, we may have had uh, similar obstacles in our life, but one reason that we face these obstacles may be that our concept of God is not clear enough to compel us to want to know Him. So I think it's a good thing to ask ourselves, how do I perceive God? How do I perceive that He views me and interacts with me, especially when I stumble? I think if we reflect on the answers to this question, it would be very revealing to us what our concept of God is. But if we're confused, if we're not clear about what God means to us, fortunately we have the answers in Paramahansaji's teachings. And Sri Dayamataji expressed it so beautifully when she said, the core of Master's teachings is that God is love. And for the devotee who felt that God is too remote, too far away, who hears our prayers but doesn't respond, Paramahansaji said, God is not a mute, unfeeling being. He is love itself. So God is love, love itself, and love is something we all yearn for. We all want a love that doesn't fade, a love that doesn't fail, a love that's always there for us, a love that's all fulfilling, and a love that's unconditional. And Paramahansaji tells us that in God, we have the one who loves us this way, unconditionally and 
eternally. And there isn't anything that any of us could ever do or not do that would in any way diminish His love for us. No matter how much trouble or heartache or pain we find ourselves in as a result of our poor choices, He loves us still and He accepts us just as we are. And, you know, to understand that God accepts us just as we are is sometimes hard for the mind to grasp because so many of us, especially here in the West, were influenced in our early years to think that God judges us or punishes us for our missteps. So we go around feeling guilty or that we will never measure up. But to think of God in these terms is to view Him according to human standards. You know, we're creating God in our image. <laughs> But this is the wrong concept of God. Not only does He accept us, He's most compassionate toward us. He understands that the wrong choices, the poor choices we've made happened because we didn't know Him. And He understands how difficult it is to escape the hypnotic influence of Maya. Guruji said, He knows He got us into this trouble. And He also said, The Lord doesn't mind your faults. He minds your indifference. Your indifference to Him. But when we are determined to improve and we reach out for His help, He responds, by leading us out of our troubles, and by giving us a new beginning. Paramahansaji tells us, God's love is so all-embracing that no matter what wrongs we've done, He forgives us. If we love Him with all our hearts, He wipes out our karma. When I shared this saying of Paramahansaji's with a devotee, she said to me, but sister, I don't have the capacity to love God the way Jesus loves him or the way Master loves him. But that's not what Master's saying. He's saying if we strive to love him with all our hearts, to the best of our ability, the Lord receives our love. And because He wants us back, He forgives us and gives us many new beginnings. And you and I are proof of that. That's why we're here today. There's a beautiful story that illustrates this point. It's the meeting between Jesus and the woman of Samaria and the miracle that takes place. While Jesus and his disciples were traveling from Judea to Galilee, Jesus purposely chose to pass through a region that was in between the two, where most Jews would not go at that time. The place was called Samaria. And in Paramahansaji's commentary in The Second Coming of Christ, he explains that this meeting between Jesus and the woman at the well was not a chance encounter, but a divinely devised reunion between Jesus and a disciple of His from a previous incarnation. And so while His disciples had gone to the city of Sichar to buy food, Jesus sat alone at the well where the woman would likely encounter Him. And because no one is a stranger to Jesus, he engages the woman in conversation, asking her to share with him the water that she draws from the well. And Jesus uses this friendly gesture to put her at ease so that she can get acquainted with him. 
And he says to her, Give me to drink. And she replies, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answers, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Meaning the living water of God contact, without which no human being can quench his spiritual thirst. She says, Sir, give me this water, that I not thirst, neither come hither to draw. Jesus says, Go call thy husband, and come hither. She replies, I have no husband. And Jesus says, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly. She responds, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Now Paramahansaji explains that when Jesus tells her to bring her husband, he's testing her to see how she responds. And because she doesn't hide her situation but truly confesses to the Master, she passes this test. And Jesus then blesses her and awakens her spiritually so that she can realize that she is indeed in the presence of a prophet of God. And you could see also that by his words, Jesus not only let her know that he knows her completely, but he also, out of his compassion, he lets her know that her privacy is safe in his hands. And we see how thoughtful and how sensitive Jesus dealt with her. Here's the rest of the story. Just then, the disciples return from the city, and so she leaves her water jug there, and she goes to tell everyone she meets, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And those Samaritans that she told about Jesus, they flocked to the Master. And when they were with him, they implored him to tarry with them. And he dwelt with them for two days and taught them. And the Gospel tells us that many more believed in Jesus because they heard his own words and felt his divine presence. And they too realized, as did the woman at the well, that they were in the living presence of the Christ. In this story, there are so many beautiful takeaways. First, we see the great love and compassion of a master for his disciple. Jesus doesn't view her as a sinner, but as a soul. And he lovingly planned this reunion between the two of them to reestablish the relationship that they shared of guru and disciple. And we also see, and this is so important to grasp, that in the consciousness of the Great Ones, there is never, ever a trace of condemnation. But as Paramahansaji says, God sees the changeless beauty of our souls. He knows we are not our mistakes. And if God sees the changeless beauty of our souls, then let us dwell on the glorious beauty of our Creator and on the relationship that we can have with Him. Let that, let that be the focus. And the last takeaway is this. If you're looking for a concept of God that you can hold on to, look to the Masters, look to Jesus, to Paramahansaji, to the great Gurus, 
because in them you will see what God would be like if he walked upon the earth. Our next question is, how can we make our prayers more effective? Well, first of all, prayer is simple conversation with God, just as the woman had that conversation with Jesus and the disciple of Guruji talked to him. We don't have to be formal with God. Just be yourself. Just be real. Be sincere. Open your heart and mind and pour out your thoughts and your feelings to him. But at the same time, in order to make our prayers more effective, they need to be centered on God rather than focused on our problems. Many people pray to God, and that's a good thing, but often what God hears is, Dear Lord, thank you for hearing my prayer. And then they launch right in, telling him about all their problems and asking for this and that and expecting him to answer according to their wishes. You know, I would call this problem-centered prayer rather than God-centered prayer. Granted, we all have worries and concerns, but if we focus too much on our problems, they become all-consuming and then they become a distraction for us when it comes time to meditate upon God. And this is why Guruji tells us repeatedly that the moment we enter our meditation room or the mandir, wherever we enter, leave your problems and worries outside the door. Not to worry, they'll be there waiting for you when you emerge. But listen to the poetic way in which Paramahansiji describes the focus that our prayers should have. To make your prayer demands effective, you must not let your attention go beyond the precincts of the temple of your devotion. So beautiful. He's saying, think of God and not else. This is the time to be with Him, to think of Him in whatever aspect of God is near and dear to our hearts, so that He becomes for us someone we can love and trust, knowing that He has our highest interest at heart. And if we cultivate that intimate relationship with God, then when we sit to practice the techniques of meditation, they will take us very quickly to God. And then when we commune with that divine presence, His transforming touch is upon us and something very beautiful happens. We're changed, we're no longer the same. And a new consciousness is awakened within us and it begins to emerge. And it can manifest in different ways as an unshakable faith that says, not only can I cope with my heavy load, but no adversity will ever be insurmountable for me. We have to understand that merging our consciousness with God empowers us to surmount all obstacles. That's the whole point. And then we realize we're anchored in something divine, something not of this world. And Paramahansaji calls this faith the meditation-born conviction that we are made in the omnipotent, all-knowing, all-seeing image of God. That is what is imparted to us in meditation. And through meditation, we also gain an inner sense of direction. We may find ourselves in the right place at the right time, as if there's this unseen hand guiding us through all of our activities. So, to sum up, in meditation, the Lord imparts to us His divine strength with which to adequately address any of our problems. And here are a few more of those poetic but powerful descriptions of the Master 
with which to approach adversity. Learn to stand unshaken midst the crash of breaking worlds. You are immortal. Your trials are mortal. You can unleash infinite powers and shatter your finite trials. So being united to that divine power is the best way to make our prayer most effective. The next question is about faith and trust. How can I cultivate faith and trust when we have no certainty about whether or not our prayers will be answered? Does God really hear our every prayer? Very good question. And this is one that I can personally relate to. There was a time when I was going through a difficult situation and I needed assurance, any kind of assurance, that God was going to answer my prayer. Now, one day I was doing some research and I came across this beautiful divine promise in the Old Testament. It's from the Psalms. And as I read it, it seemed as if God was speaking directly to me. And it reads this way. I will instruct you and teach you in the way in which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And I can only say that those were, in those words, I, I received a divine assurance that has never left me. But why is it that God can make these promises and keep them? The truth is that God knows us better than we know ourselves. We really don't have to tell Him anything because He sees the entire panorama of our life. And He wants us to involve Him in all aspects of our life because He's keenly interested in everything about us. And it touches Him when we bring Him close and we turn to Him for guidance. But at the same time, when we pray, it's important to understand that in His omniscience, God is going to answer in His own way, not necessarily in the way that we want, or when we want it. This is something that's very frustrating for people, and it weakens their faith. But Paramahansaji says people think God doesn't respond to their prayers because they don't understand that God sometimes answers differently from what they expect or ask for. Now consider this. We see but a fragment of any given situation. God sees the whole in detail, and He looks not only to this brief moment in time, but beyond to the greater good. And so this is where faith and trust enter in, because He will answer us in His own time. He is working on our behalf, and when He answers, it will be with the most harmonious and beneficial outcome for everyone concerned. And I'm sure that if you think about it in retrospect, you found that this is the case, has been the case for you. This is our last question. It's really a good question. I have heard the saying, let go and let God. I assume this refers to surrender. But can you explain when should we let go and why we should let go? Can you also explain what real surrender means? Yes, the saying to let go and let God does refer to surrender. So now when should we let go? We should let go when we've done everything in our power adequately address the situation to the very best of our ability, and when we've prayed to God for His help, that is when we let go and we leave the matter in His hands. Why should we let go? 
because God has the power over that situation that we do not have. That's why we surrender the matter to Him. But surrender doesn't mean saying we surrender when inside we're still fretting about it. That's not surrender because then we're still in the driver's seat. Genuine surrender means setting aside our own desire for an outcome with an unwavering conviction in our hearts that God will respond in His own time, whether it's three weeks from now, three months from now, three years from now. He's looking for this kind of faith in us, a faith that says, I know with every fiber of my being, Lord, that you are with me through this, through thick and thin. A trust that says, I cannot know what to do, but my trust in you is without reservation. And when we pray like this, this type of prayer God always responds to unfailingly because we're saying to him, I trust in your love. Sri Dayamataji expressed it so beautifully. Her words are profound and very revealing. She said, I have found that my deepest spiritual awakenings come when I surrender and you too will find it so. Inwardly turn to him and say, Lord, I surrender my heart to you. I care not what you do with me. Whether you come to me or not, I only know that I love you. That sense of trust and surrender brings such a sweet relationship with God. No words can describe it. Just let go and let Him enter your life. Does it take courage to let go and let God? It takes tremendous courage because we're being asked to step into the unknown, to trust and to let God do His work through us and in us. And I can guarantee you, that the work that He does will far exceed our every expectation. And I would offer this to you. Why not conduct your own experiment of letting go and letting God and see what He does with your life? If you try surrendering to the best of your ability, you will have entered into what Paramahansaji calls an extraordinary divine adventure with God. He said, Life is the greatest adventure imaginable. Although some lives are without much interest and excitement, others are full of extraordinary experiences. And listen to this part. To fathom the nature of spirit is the greatest adventure in this universe. So in closing, I want to share a story with you that describes with childlike simplicity the nature of faith, trust, and surrender to God. At first, I saw God as my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like a president, but I didn't really know him. But later on, when I met him, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike ride. But it was a tandem bike, a bicycle built for two. And I noticed that he was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know just when it was that he suggested we change places, but life has not been the same since. When I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring, but predictable. 
it was the shortest distance between two points. But when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts up mountains and through rocky places at breakneck speeds. It was all I could do to hang on. Even though it looked like madness, he said, pedal. I worried and was anxious and asked, where are you taking me? He laughed and didn't answer, and I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered into the great adventure. And when I'd say, I'm scared, he'd lean back and touch my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed. Gifts of healing, acceptance, love and joy. They gave me gifts to take on our journey, my lords and mine, and we were off again. He said, give the gifts away, they're extra baggage, too much weight. So I did, to other people we met, and I found that in giving I received, and still our burden was light. You see, I did not trust him at first to be in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck it. But he knows bike secrets. He knows how to make it bend to take sharp corners, knows how to jump to clear high rocks, and knows how to fly to shorten scary passages. And I'm learning to be observant as we pedal in the strangest of places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful companion by my side. And when I'm sure I just can't do any more, he just smiles and says, pedal. This delightful story so beautifully describes how we can go through life with that divine beloved by our side. So let's embark on that great adventure, why not? And see where he takes us, remembering every step of the way, his immortal promise. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye ever upon you. Now for the next few minutes, let us spend time praying for others, for all those who have asked for our healing prayers, for all those who are in need of God's help. Let us pray for our friends and our family, for our nation, and for peace in this world. Please rise now. We will have our closing prayer and our healing service, and we will practice Paramahansaji's healing technique together. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies. Let us raise our hands and chant Om for the body. Om. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their minds. Let us raise our hands and chant Om for their minds. Om. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their souls. Let 
us raise our hands and chant Om for their souls. Om. Divine Mother, spread thy mantle of peace over all the earth that men and nations everywhere may learn to live together in peace and harmony. Let us raise our hands and chant Om for world peace. Om. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavtar Babaji, Lardi Mashai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, Divine Gurudev, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, no matter where I go or what I do, may the spotlight of my mind ever keep turning toward thee, and in the battle din of activity, may my silent war cry ever be, God, God, God. Om Shanti. Amen.